Good morning to everyone and welcome. Uh, I'm Paul Carice, the director of this new department at Arizona State University. The long name and the big program, the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. And on behalf of the faculty and staff of the school, I'm pleased to welcome everyone to our annual conference. This is the sixth event in the series of speaker events we've done this year on the theme of citizenship and civic leadership in America. We started in the fall with Robert Putnam. We've had uh, speaker events and dialogues on immigration, on the civic role of journalism, on Arizona politics. We had our Martin Luther King Day uh, event. Oh, there we go. Martin Luther King Day event um, was also part of uh, this series. Uh, we call the major speaker series for the school the Civic Discourse Project. It's now in its third year, and the school is just in its third year. Our school, we go by the acronym SCETL, uh, has co-sponsored this Civic Discourse Project since 2017 with two ASU partners, the Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication and the Senator O'Connor College of Law. Uh, as I mentioned, we're happy to be collaborating again with Arizona PBS. They record all of our events in the Civic Discourse Project. The episodes then air on Channel 8 locally, and they're archived on the PBS website. All of our speaker events in the series, in the major series and otherwise, also are archived on our website and on our YouTube site. Um, we have an annual Constitution Day lecture, and as I mentioned, we have an annual Martin Luther King Day lecture as well. So we are delighted to have gathered uh, such a distinguished range of speakers and range of voices, writers, uh, thinkers, scholars, to speak here over the next two days. I hope you had a chance to look at your program to see the range of people we are hearing from. We're glad that all of you can join us for this intellectual and civic conversation. Uh, intellectual diversity is a major feature of the Civic Discourse Project to assemble public intellectuals, national caliber scholars from a range of viewpoints and disciplines to address important civic and scholarly themes. We think this exemplifies the ideal of civic, civil disagreement, and also argues for its importance in higher education in American society. I'm also pleased today to welcome some special supporters of the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership from our National Board of Counselors. This is a bipartisan group of experienced leaders in public affairs and civil society they advise us on uh, our school and also our Center for Political Thought and Leadership on two important themes. The first, American civic education, and the second, the civic norm of civil disagreement. Two distinguished public servants agreed to co-chair the Board of Counselors, former Maryland Lieutenant Governor Kathleen Kennedy Townsend and former U.S. Senator John Kyle. The board also includes the head of the Urban League, Mark Morial, and the former publisher of the Washington Post, Don Graham. Senator Kyle is with us today, as are three other members of this 10-person board, uh, two of whom I'll mention now, and one of whom I you know, know is also here, Anna Tovar, the mayor of Tulsa, uh, Arizona, and I think we will see you later today, Ron Christie, who's a former domestic policy advisor in the George W. Bush White House. So please join me in welcoming Senator Kyle and our other members of the, the Board of Counselors. Just a brief word on the mission of this new department at Arizona State University, and then I'll introduce our first keynote speaker for the conference. The School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership is reviving the crucial link between civic education and liberal education in higher education and beyond. We think this is the best foundation for preparing thoughtful leaders for American civil society and for public service. We offer courses on great works and debates of political, moral, and economic thought supplemented by internships, study abroad experiences, special leadership courses, and public events like this, all to provide experiences about leadership and statecraft. This is the kind of foundation we hope will provide both understanding and practical experience with leadership for 21st century America and our globalized world. We also think in our public speaker events that returning to some fundamental ideas and questions can provide a broader and calming perspective in our polarized and divided times. The extended dialogue you will see across this two-day conference, capturing a breadth of views about both classic and current debates over citizenship in free political communities, about the meaning of American citizenship, and about liberal democracy and civic education. This is for us a public version of what we strive to do in our undergraduate and graduate courses. 
So whether you're visiting us from near or from far, we hope you will pick up some information about the school uh, to include one of our distinctive U.S. pocket constitutions and also spread the word about our effort to link liberal education, civic education, intellectual diversity, and civil disagreement. And so to our first keynote speaker, who is a civil and measured conservative voice in this often unmeasured era of American politics. It's a delight to introduce Rich Lowry, who became editor of National Review in 1997, when he was selected by William F. Buckley Jr. to lead the magazine. National Review remains a conservative guidepost, helping to bring to prominence rising conservative voices and to advance conservative policies. And it's an achievement that he is still in print and now joined by his very lively website, National Review Online. Lowry is a syndicated columnist and political commentator, including a weekly column that he does with Politico. He's a frequent guest on Meet the Press, on This Week, and on Fox News Sunday. He's the author of a New York Times best-selling book on President Bill Clinton, also of Lincoln Unbound, which explores Lincoln's political beliefs and his climb to the presidency, and most recently the author of The Case for Nationalism, How It Made Us Powerful, United, and Free. And we are also grateful to know that Rich serves on our board of counselors for the school. After his prepared remarks, he will take questions from the audience, so please join me in welcoming Rich Clowney. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, to be part of this great event. And I think it's so important that Skettle brings together so many people from such a wide range of views to discuss important topics like the one uh, of this conference. Um, I also have to say, as a conservative who lives and works in New York City, it's a great advantage to me to travel because when I travel pretty much anywhere, I'm going to more political, politically congenial territory. Uh, just to give you an idea of how isolating it is to be a conservative uh, in Manhattan, where I live, uh, when the Republican primaries rolled around in 2016 and finally got to New York, uh, because I'm incorrigible, I voted for Ted Cruz. And the New York Times has this amazing feature now where after an election, you can go back and, and look precinct by precinct and see the absolute uh, vote total. So I was kind of curious about this. So I looked at our precinct uh, the next day I was astonished to find that my wife and I accounted for 20% of the Cruz vote in our precinct. Yeah, you, you do the math. And then I, then I looked uh, to the next precinct south of us, and there was one Cruz vote. I was like, I know that guy. You know, he goes to my church. So uh, I'm going to talk today a little bit about nationalism, uh, which is that there's been a lot of discussion about it lately in our national debate, occasioned by Brexit, occasioned by Donald Trump. Uh, those of you who know anything about National Review know we've had a complicated relationship uh, with Donald Trump. We came out with him against him very forcefully in the primaries. Shots were fired uh, back and forth, but there's kind of been at least a cessation of uh, hostilities uh, for the moment. Um, I'll uh, share with you the, the first uh, um, outreach, which is I, I was uh, away for a holiday. I came back to the office after being gone for a while, and I found this brown envelope from the White House on my chair, so I was kind of curious what it was. I opened it up, and it was a, a ripped out copy of one of my columns that had run in the New York Post. Now, I'm a New Yorker. I consider the New York Post the nation's newspaper. Uh, more importantly, the President of the United States still considers it the nation's newspaper. And I'd written this column about uh, uh, this off-year election in Virginia, where the gubernatorial candidate, an establishment Republican, did everything he could possibly to distance himself from Donald Trump. He's like, I don't know Donald Trump. I've never met Donald Trump. I don't want to talk about Donald Trump. Please stop asking me questions about Donald Trump. And this didn't matter at all to voters. He got wiped out by this wave in the suburbs of voters who wanted to send a message against Donald Trump. So I wrote this column about how this Trump is such a dominating cultural and political figure, there's no escaping him. And I thought I had you know, a lot of incisive uh, insights um, in, uh, in this column, not all of which were favorable to the president, but that's not what caught his eye. Uh, what got his attention was the headline that the New York Post editors had put on this column, which was, there is only Trump. And Trump had taken out his signature black sharpie, had circled this headline, 
drew a big arrow and wrote, Rich. So true, Donald J. Trump. So that's, that's the way it's felt for me basically the last three and a half uh, years. So uh, let me talk um, a little bit about nationals. What I'm going to do is give you my take on what it is, um, on what I believe its contribution has been to the American uh, tradition, um, what I think a more truthful and grounded uh, definition and understanding of our national identity is, and then I'll, I'll draw out some, some loose implications from all this, and then I'll be happy uh, to take your uh, questions. So first, just a basic, as a basic matter of definition, uh, a lot of people lazily believe that patriotism is the word for everything that is good about national loyalty, national feeling, and that nationalism is the word for everything that's bad about those things. And I believe that is a wrong and unsustainable definition. If you want to be technical about it, patriotism comes from the Latin patre, same uh, root as patriarchy, father, fatherland. It's loyalty to your own is what patriotism is. Nationalism is a much more uh, specific uh, concept which is basically the idea that a discrete people united by a common culture, a common history, very often a common language, should govern a distinct territory. That is nationalism in a nutshell. Now, nationalism uh, in the contemporary political context is oftentimes caught up with populism. Uh, but that is a distinct uh, phenomenon. A phenomenon, by the way, that my magazine has had a very ambivalent uh, relationship with. Bill Buckley, the founder of National Review, famously said he'd rather be governed by the first 5,000 people in the Boston phone book than the faculty of Harvard, which is a populist statement. But he was also unabashedly uh, an elitist. Um, you know, it's spring training here in Arizona, and Bill Buckley was once asked, if you'd like to go to a baseball game. And he said, no thanks, I've already been to one. So, <laughs> so let me make uh, five points and offer five propositions about nationalism. The first is that it's very old, it's very powerful, it's very natural. And to illustrate this point, let's go to one of the great monsters of world history, Joan of Arc, okay? So uh, Joan, as a 13-year-old girl, has a vision in her father's garden from an angel that she is going to liberate France. France at this time is occupied by uh, the English. The English kings were obsessed at this time not just with the idea of governing England, but with the idea that they should also govern France. Uh, they had originally come uh, from France, from Normandy. Um, the Hundred Years' War is going on at this time. Uh, when, when at, at this time, France has been occupied maybe 75 years, is riven by a, a civil war. Uh, you have various French factions, various uh, sides of this conflict. The population has been decimated by the conflict uh, and, and by famine. And Joan has this vision that she's going to stop this. And through some amazing act of will, she convinces the French authorities that she should have a, be allowed to have a go at this. And famously, she is uh, with French forces at the city of Orleans, which is under siege uh, from the English. And she begins passing messages over to the English forces. You know, she writes them a note. Um, just want to let you know, I'm Joan. I'm here to chase you one and all uh, from France. And if you don't leave, I'm going to kill each one of you. Just wanted to let you know. Um, and she, she you know, shoots uh, messages uh, to the, over to the English side uh, by arrow. And the English forces, surely you know, these hard-bitten uh, guys, take this uh, as seriously as you would expect, which is not at all. You know, they shout abuse across the parapets. They call her a whore. Um, upon hearing this abuse, Joan reacts the way you might expect, uh, stereotypically, a, a teenage girl to react. She cries tears of insult and shame. And then she does what no teenage girl had ever done in the history of, world, of, of the world before or since. She mounts a white horse. She leads her forces in battle, carrying a 12-foot banner 
of Christ sitting in judgment and vanquishes the English forces from Orleans and wins an amazing succession of victories, actually makes good on her astonishing pledge that she was going to restore the French heir to the French throne, and then her luck runs out. She is betrayed by the Burgundians, who are on the other side of the Civil War, to the English, who take her and subject her to what's, in effect, a show trial. Um, lots of, of questioning, uh, all of which uh, is meant to find her guilty, which, sure enough, the English do. They burn her at the stake. They, uh, she proclaims the name of Christ during this ordeal, and they spread her ashes in the Seine River. And what is the point of doing that? Well, the point of that is to wipe out all memory of this amazing event having happened, to wipe out all memory of Joan, this girl who at the time is 19 years old. And of course, exactly the opposite happens because Joan has become a symbol of her nation and will live through all time uh, because of that. When centuries later, the French are occupied by a much more hideous foreign force, uh, the Nazis, what symbol do the free French forces adopt and take as their own? Well, they paint on their planes, they paint on their ships the Cross of Lorraine, which is a symbol of Joan, the leader of those French forces, who himself becomes a formidable symbol of the French nation, Charles de Gaulle, when he is, uh, dies and buried, his home village erects a 145-foot you know, tall cross of Lorraine at the gate of the village to honor him. This is a profound statement of the power of nationalism. And this is why, although throughout history, empires have tried to eradicate it, totalitarian ideologies have tried to eradicate it, they have never succeeded. They always fail. Now, there are empires, obviously, that have had great runs. You look at the traditional uh, European empires. The Habsburgs uh, occupied the center of Europe for 600 years. The last uh, Habsburg empire alone um, rules for 68 years. If you break that up into presidential terms, that's 17 terms. Some of you might be sick of President Trump even before we finished one term. This was 17 uh, terms. But what has happened? The Habsburgs, the Ottomans, the Russians, as soon as their co coercive apparatus gives way, the constituent uh, nations in these empires want to go and govern themselves. That's also what happens in the 20th century with the Soviet Empire. It's what happens in the 20th century with the European colonial empires. Gandhi says that being ruled by the British Empire is a living death of a whole people. And no one will choose uh, such a living death. People want to govern themselves. Now, any powerful force can be abused. Nationalism can be abused and has been abused, but all sorts of things in our fallen world are abused. Religion is abused. Democracy is abused. Certain otherwise worthy ideals are abused. And we don't conclude, because of that, at least most of us don't, that therefore we should turn our backs on those things. And the same is true of nationalism. So that's my first point. Second, it's very important to realize that modern nationalism, which arises in the 19th century, is a liberal force. The great nationalists of the 19th century are liberals. They're agitating against these empires. They're agi agitating against monarchs who have a view that the nation is their sole uh, property. And these nationalists, they want to create a system based on popular sovereignty, based on citizenship, and based on self government. And nationalism, nationalism is really uh, necessary to the development of democracy as we know it. To have a democracy, you must have a demos. You must have a people who feel a common bond with one another and therefore have social trust that lubricates your politics, 
that lubricates uh, markets. And without this sense, uh, you don't get what, sh what Roger Scruton, uh, the late British philosopher, said is the contribution of nationalism, which is to create this sense of we, of a people being a first person uh, plural. And when you don't have that sense, very bad things happen. You look at Africa in the Middle East, where you have these states with artificial borders at the inheritance of uh, European uh, colonialism, and these, these states have an insufficient sense of nationalism and national unity. And what's been proved over time, yes, you can have elections, but you're not going to have social trust. You very often have social breakdown. You have coups. You have civil wars uh, and other forms of civil conflict because there's not a sense of national unity. And it's no accident that uh, in the post-war uh, world, in the 20th and 21st century, when we've created this norm that uh, the, the world should be composed of sovereign nation states who borders are sacrosanct, that this development has coincided with, uh, in the context of world history, an extraordinary period of international uh, peace. So those are my two points about nationalism in general. Let's now look a little bit about uh, at, at the American uh, tradition. Uh, which is my third point. Um, nationalism is part of the mainstream of the American tradition. You don't get an American revolution without nationalism. The basic contention of the American revolution is that we are a nation that should govern itself and not, should not be part of an empire and govern from an imperial center across an ocean. You don't get the Constitution without nationalism. The basic impetus for the Constitution is that we need to have a strong and capable national government or the American project will fall apart and be discredited before it truly begins. You don't get victory in the Civil War without nationalism, which underlines the legitimacy of the American nation state. This is a tradition, runs through Hamilton, it runs through Lincoln, it runs through TR, you can see it in the 20th century, and FDR and Reagan. So let's dig in just a little bit on each of those figures. Hamilton is really the taproot of the American nationalist tradition. He's the prime, uh, one of the prime movers behind the adoption of the Constitution because he believes we should have a national government worthy of the name. He has this nationalizing uh, economic program, we're going to fund the national debt, we're going to bolster manufacturing, we're going to have a national uh, bank. He writes Washington's farewell address, uh, which has come to be relatively neglected uh, these days, but was one of the great state papers in American history and a nationalist uh, state paper. People uh, oftentimes think it's an isolationist statement. It is not. It's warnings against foreign entanglements uh, have to do with the historical context of the time, which is uh, Hamilton and Washington think we sh shouldn't get in a war, embroiled in a war with either Britain or France at a time where we're a young um, country that is uh, just beginning to uh, get its legs under it. But the, uh, the farewell address says we need to foster national unity, we need to be jealous of our national uh, sovereignty, we need to muster our national strength and believe in our national destiny. And then uh, finally, uh, Hamilton believes that we need to have a strong navy to protect our trade and to protect our national integrity. And all of this uh, is towards the end of creating a nation here that is a, a strong and great nation uh, on, on par with Great Britain. So this tradition passes uh, through to uh, Lincoln uh, in, in a different uh, iteration, but related. You know, Lincoln has a nationalist near ancestor worship for the founders of the country that he describes as the Iron Men of the Revolution and our fathers. Um, he uh, believes in the nationalizing economic program of Henry Clay, who in many ways is the heir uh, to Hamilton. He's attracted to Clay not into the Whigs, not just from this economic program, but also because uh, the Whigs believed 
and order and self-discipline, which is profoundly uh, attractive um, to Lincoln, who at a time when America was soaked in alcohol and tobacco and foul language, didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't swear, told the occasional uh, off-color story. At a time, it was at a time when uh, uh, America oftentimes had a casual uh, cruelty towards animals. Lincoln was incredibly tender-hearted uh, towards animals. We had a, a dinner, some of us who are speakers uh, today, last night at a restaurant that had a little house cat and it reminded me of the story of Lincoln in the White House. A, a guest um, said he was invited to a, a dinner, and uh, the White House cat was seated at a chair uh, at this uh, dinner at the table, and Lincoln was uh, feeding the cat uh, with, the, with a, a, a spoon, and as any married man would understand, Mary Todd was uh, quite upset by this uh, and you know, said to the guest, can you believe the president is feeding this cat uh, with the White House flatware, and Lincoln said, you know what, if this spoon was good enough for President Buchanan, it's good enough for Tabby. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Lincoln obviously believed in the, uh, the integrity of the Union, and his first inaugural is a long uh, brief uh, for national unity, where he makes the case that um, the, the perpetual nature of the Union is implied in the entire project, uh, that there's no uh, real legitimate geographic separation or lines uh, between the North and the South, that the Union is older uh, than just the Constitution, and we're united by these uh, deep historical and cultural uh, connections, which he famously calls the mystic chords of memory, with some help uh, and some editing uh, from William Seward, which to me just goes to how everyone needs an editor, okay? Everyone needs uh, an editor. Even the Declaration of Independence, astonishingly, was improved by the editing of a committee uh, of, of Congress, which is the first time that's ever happened. And the story goes that Thomas Jefferson was kind of outraged by uh, all this tinkering with his handiwork, and Franklin could tell he was upset and told him the story about a, a hatter um, who had a sign he was going to hang outside his business, um, but uh, asked an editor to look at it. And the sign was, John Thompson Hatter makes and sells hats for ready money. And the editor says, well, of course you're Hatter. I mean, you're selling hats, so strike that. No one cares who's making the hats. You know, that, that's irrelevant. Strike that. And of course you're selling them, right? You're not giving them away. So he strikes that. So you end up just with the sign being John Thompson with a picture of a hat. Uh, I'm not sure whether Jefferson was really comforted by this, but Franklin tried to comfort him. Um, and then finally, um, Lincoln, uh, you know, his, his uh, rhetoric and thought is, is soaked um, with um, uh, musings about God's purposes, and he has, has a great modesty uh, about this, very importantly, but as one historian archly observed, you can search all of Lincoln without getting one hint that he thought that God could possibly manage without a unified uh, United States. Um, then there's TR, who believes that our natural wonders in this country, a lot of which are in this neighborhood, belong to the nation and should be preserved as such and kept for future generations, who believes that immigrants, when, this, uh, when they come to this country, should be, as he put it, Americanized and totally assimilated. And uh, again, going all the way back to Hamilton, believes in a strong navy, sends the great white fleet around the world, one of the great peacetime achievements of the United States Navy, and thinks deeply about what our responsibilities will be when we truly become a great world power of the sort Hamilton had just imagined. Very briefly, FDR and Reagan. You know, FDR uh, sells the New Deal with national symbols and, and tropes and calls for national uh, unity. Uh, his rhetoric and his program in World War II are soaked uh, with nationalism. I don't care where you are uh, on the political spectrum, I defy you to read the third inaugural address. There are, there are a lot of FDR inaugural addresses. Read the third inaugural address or read the D-Day prayer and not be profoundly uh, moved. Uh, with Reagan, obviously a different policy uh, program, uh, but his slogan is, let's make America great again, which might sound uh, familiar. 
He believes deeply in this national sense of destiny, which he expresses with the phrase, shining city on a hill. And his political program is, is based on um, uh, 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 removing the sense of national doubt uh, that came from the 70s and mustering our national strength. And that, that both Reagan and um, uh, FDR have nationalist aspects to him to them just goes to how both the left and the right uh, should have access uh, to nationalism. And I think nationalism is only foreclosed to you if you are a libertarian who believe that markets should trump absolutely everything, including borders, and um, if you are shocked and outraged at the notion that this country has a national government, or if you're a cosmopolitan who believes that borders are inherently hateful uh, and nations are small-minded. Otherwise, you should have access uh, to nationalism. And just, just last um, point on, on nationalism being part of the mainstream of the American tradition before I move on. If you look at the kind of great nationalist periods in American history, they're not the hellscapes you would expect uh, if anti-nationalists are correct. And th this is an inherently uh, a, a hateful tradition. After the War of 1812, there's this great national exuberance um, and optimism around the outcome of that war, which might not have been totally justified. I mean, we nearly had a secession crisis in New England during that war, and by the way, the White House was burned to the ground. Uh, but we were delighted that we fought uh, the British to uh, a draw, and there was this period of consensus nationalism around a Hamiltonian uh, program until it gets blown up by the Jacksonians uh, waging war on the Eastern, Eastern uh, finan financiers, and when you have this contention uh, over the tariff and over the nature of the union. And in fact, one of the more portentous uh, developments in this period, kind of early, mid-19th century, is, is uh, the course of John C. Calhoun's career. Brilliant man, uh, great logician, um, not a great rigorous thinker, not the warmest and fuzziest guy. Uh, people used to say that Calhoun would never be able to write a love poem because every clause would be begin with the word whereas. Um, but, he, but he shows up in Congress as a war hawk, as a believer in a strong military, as a believer in, in internal improvements, and then under political pressure in South Carolina turns around and becomes a southern uh, patriot and develops uh, these doctrines that eventually will uh, be used to nearly tear the country apart. And then you look at the post-World War, uh, the post-Civil War uh, period where you have veterans of the Union Army uh, agitating for the display of the American flag and agitating for the teaching of American history in our schools, which are not you know, malevolent uh, activities. In the mid-20th century, you have these couple decades of a consensus uh, nationalism. That gives us, among uh, other things, the Apollo uh, program. Now, we're all familiar with the Neil Armstrong you know, statement, great leap for mankind, just kind of puts a universal uh, gloss on the moonshot. But this was a profoundly national endeavor. The precipitating reason for it was the competition with the Soviet Union. It was suffused with American symbolism. Uh, the lunar module is called Eagle. The command module is called uh, Columbia. There was some discussion initially about planting a UN flag on the moon. This was uh, quickly abandoned. Instead, uh, they obviously planted an American flag on the moon. They had some trouble with this because they weren't able to pract uh, practice it. They weren't quite able to extend the horizontal arm, which is why the flag looked as though it had a wave. They had great difficulty planting it in the lunar dust, which doesn't go very deep. Uh, Buzz Aldrin was afraid they, it just, he wouldn't be able to get it in. Uh, but they do, and they get the shot, and then they, you know, they, they blast back off to uh, a rendezvous with the command, command module. Unfortunately, there are no cameras or, or videos to capture the fact that when they blasted back off, they knocked down the flag after all that, <laughs> after all that effort. So <clears throat> let's go to our national identity. Fourth point, America is not, as is commonly said, just an idea. This is a, a prevalent cliche in our national conversation. Lindsey Graham and Joe Biden 
aren't on speaking terms right now. Um, but both of them say all the time, America is an idea. Now, obviously, our ideals are important to us, but no nation is an abstraction in that sense. That is absurd, right? You can ask uh, even a political philosopher, um, where are you from? And if he or she is, is uh, in his or her right mind, he's not going to say, oh, well, I'm glad you asked. I'm from Locke's Second Treatise, Chapter 6, Section 7, right? Um, place matters uh, to, be, to people. The more uh, sophisticated version of the argument, we're just an idea, is that we're just defined by so-called civic nationalism, that, which is all about ideals um, and institutions. And there's a lot to be said for that. There's a lot to be said for that. But for me, that misses um, a, another part of the story, which is how our culture uh, unites us. Let's, let's uh, consider a, a tourist <coughs> metaphor. If tonight, on the par steps of the Paris Opera House, an African-American meets a European-American, they instantly have more in common than anyone around them. They speak the same language so they can understand each other. They probably dress largely the same way. They like largely the same cuisine. And they have this enormous common stock of cultural knowledge and attitudes and predilections. So it doesn't matter whether what part of the country they're from, what their politics are, they're united uh, by all this. Another uh, tourist uh, metaphor. Um, if in the, a Munich beer garden tonight, the Germans get together and they say, oh, look at that guy over there. I think he's American. You know, they, they don't say, oh, I think, yeah, I think he believes in the preamble of the Declaration of Independence. No, they say, he's loud, he's boisterous, he might be fat, he's an American. Um, and, and these are just cultural markers who in, that indelibly make us uh, who we are. Um, Fifth point, I just want to dig in on this idea of culture, because the examples I, I gave might seem relatively slight, but there are just deep, long-running gro uh, grooves of culture that define this country uh, um, from the beginning to this day. Um, I, I just find it astonishing that if you consider the history of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, Puritans began settling Massachusetts Bay 1630-ish, uh, 1632 uh, maybe, and they took advantage of a loophole in the charter they got from the King of England for this project and took the charter with them to Massachusetts Bay, which they weren't supposed to do. And very quickly, they begin worshiping their God their own way. They begin governing themselves their own way and in ways that aren't to the liking of the King of England and the people around him. So the people around the King begin to try to convince him, well, you know what you need to do? You need to go take that charter back. You need to go get the charter. And rumor of this reaches Massachusetts Bay. The governor, John Winthrop, has to consider what to do. So he holds meetings. And the decision is made that if this happens, that they will resist the King of England by force of arms. They consider arming the Boston Harbor. They drill the militia. They put a light on the most prominent point in Boston to warn people if the king's ships begin to come. That hill to this day is known as Beacon Hill. So 140 years <clears throat> before there was a revolt against royal authority waged by stubborn and independent-minded people centered in Boston, Massachusetts. There was nearly a revolt against royal authority waged by stubborn and independent-minded people in, centered in Boston, Massachusetts. This is just how, how deep culture goes uh, in this country. And another very important aspect of our, our culture that shouldn't be neglected, very often is today, is the King James Bible. It was just hugely significant that basically every early American had a King James Bible by uh, his bedstand. Uh, this is where we get the idea that we're a chosen people, or as Lincoln said much more appropriately, an almost chosen people, 
that we live in a promised land and where we get the idea of the covenant. And the King James Bible just pro provides this incredibly uh, rich <coughs> store of rhetoric uh, and examples that run throughout um, our, our history, define our political rhetoric, uh, define our literature in important uh, respects. <coughs> Very important in making the case for the revolution. Uh, a key aspect of the, of the argument for the revolution is, was made at the pulpit um, by Protestant preachers. Even more secular advocates drew on uh, the Bible. Uh, Patrick Henry's famous give me liberty or give me death speech shot through uh, with biblical references concludes with references to Genesis and to Joshua. Uh, Samuel Adams has a famous speech, 1777, rallying a depressed Continental Congress. Um, it uh, refers, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to Exodus and how in this period of our gloomy adversity, uh, there's, a, there's a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night uh, leading us. You look more recently, Martin Luther King, uh, he famously uh, talked to the Declaration of Independence as this promissory note uh, that hasn't been cashed. Conservatives love uh, citing uh, this reference, very important reference, but when you consider uh, the rhetoric of Martin Luther King, the most imp important author that he cited was not Thomas Jefferson. It was Amos and Jeremiah and Matthew, and that's what gives his rhetoric this incredible depth and power uh, to the American uh, ear. And th this idea of the covenant that I just mentioned uh, a moment ago, defining for the American uh, project, comes from, uh, from the Old Testament, beginning with Abraham. God says to Abraham, I'll make of thee uh, a great nation. And the covenant's an amazing thing because you have an, uh, an omnipotent God who enters this bargain uh, with his people that will limit his power if his, his people are true uh, to the bargain. And the first covenant in American history is the Mayflower Compact. Then in New England, every town, every church is founded with a covenant. And the most important covenant in our history that is still central um, to America today is the Constitution, where you can see an echo of that biblical um, compact we're, we're going to have a strong and capable uh, <clears throat> national government with tremendous powers, but they're also going to be uh, limited. So what do you do with all this? Well, I, I would have, you know, as a conservative, you know, very uh, specific policy agenda uh, that arise out of, out of um, the, these, um, uh, the, these nationalist um, uh, insights and attitudes. But I, I just think uh, let, me, let me abstract from that a little bit and just go, what were some of the looser, kind of lowest common denominator uh, implications? One, as I alluded to earlier, both the left and the right can have access to nationalism and should have access to nationalism. In response to uh, some of the woeful uh, excesses and crudities uh, and divisiveness of President Trump, the left is being driven in the other direction, which I think is a, a mistake. But you look as recently as 2016, Bernie Sanders, you know, now the front runner for the Democratic uh, presidential nomination, he was uh, talking about immigration in an interview with the editor of uh, a website called Vox, uh, Ezra Klein. And Ezra Klein asked Sanders, well, you're in favor of poor people, you want to help poor people. Isn't the best way to help poor people to let them all come here, just from overseas, come into this country? And Bernie says, no, you're crazy. What are you talking about? This is a nation. Americans come first. So that, that is a nationalist uh, sentiment. He got a lot of criticism. I'm not sure he would uh, speak that way now. But that just goes to how this, this uh, uh, nationalism and having a nationalistic test for our policy is not something uh, that should be exclusive to the right. A true nationalism should emphasize also what unites us. Uh, the, the beauty of nationalism, the best forms of it, is it is a loyalty that's above sect, above tribe, and above race. White nationalism is, a, in the American context, a complete contradiction in terms. And uh, if you look at those neo-Nazi 
of protesters in Charlottesville. Their DNA runs through the KKK and domestic terrorist groups, not this mainstream American tradition uh, that I've been speaking of. And one of the ironies, if you think about it, uh, of those protests in Charlottesville, if you look at the average African American whose family hasn't uh, come here recently, the last you know, three decades or so, uh, when immigration has been loosened up, uh, the average African American surely has a longer lineage in this country than any of those idiot European American neo-Nazis marchers in Charlottesville. First sentence, census in uh, 1790, uh, one-fifth of people here were African Americans, and the majority were already native-born. Now, how they got here was hideous. The condition they were held in uh, was uh, disgraceful and a shame, but this just goes to how African Americans have been part of the cultural nation uh, of this country from the very uh, beginning. And I have um, a lot of problems with the 1619 Project of the New York Times, but the idea of focusing on this aspect of our history accurately um, is, is a good one. And the, the lead essay in that series, there's this profoundly uh, moving anecdote from the author where she talks about uh, being in a class uh, with an African-American friend and the teacher uh, was, um, ha had, had this project where innocently, you know, she wanted all, all the kids to go up, look at a globe and point to the nation that they were from, the country where they had come from. And, you know, the white kids do this readily. You know, oh, my grandma, she's here, Sweden. You know, oh, dad, Italy. She goes up with a friend, they don't know where to point because they're so American, because their families have been here forever. And that's just a profound truth that's incumbent, especially, um, I believe, uh, on conservatives uh, to take on board and, and to uh, take uh, very seriously. Um, we also, I, I believe, have to defend the cultural core of the nation, and the very molten core of that is language, is the English language. Just language runs very deep and defines who we are. And there are exceptions to this. You know, Switzerland would be one. Um, but, but very often when you have countries that don't have a, a, a dominant language or have uh, multiple languages, you get, you get problems. Look at Canada. Canada is like a really nice, pleasant place. Nothing bad ever happens in Canada. 20 years ago, Canada is nearly torn apart um, uh, by the fact that Quebec wants to go its own way because Quebec is a French-speaking province plopped in the middle of an English-speaking country, has its own distinctive culture because of that, and feels this pull to go, in, go its own way and to be independent uh, and self-governing. Spain now, uh, riven by a dissension over the status of Catalonia, uh, it has its own language and own distinctive culture. You look at the other side of the co coin. Um, in uh, six, um, 643, um, in the Treaty of uh, Verdun, Sh Charlemagne's uh, empire is, uh, sorry, 843, um, Char Charlemagne, for, for, you know, I know there's some professors here, so I, I got to be accurate. You know, I, I, don't want, I don't want to go on the qu question and answer uh, portion being off by 200 years on the Treaty of Verdun. Um, it's, but anyway, Charlemagne's empire is divided up between German and Romance-speaking uh, um, territories, and that division roughly corresponding to, you know, Germany and France lasts for a thousand years because the, the language runs um, so deep. And we also need to honor and defend our rituals and symbols, uh, include, including, very importantly, the flag, which, like language, um, has this deep emotional uh, connection and meaning. The great uh, Zionist uh, Theodore Herzl said, uh, with a flag, people will be led, perhaps even to the promised land. For a flag, men will live or die. Uh, and this is, this is a truth of human nature and applies uh, in this country, which is the most flag-soaked society in the world. We fly the flag more than any place else. We have a national anthem that's about the flag. We pledge allegiance to the flag. Heck, we have a holiday, an official federal holiday devoted to the flag. 
Um, and we have a, a flag code that has quasi-religious overtones about how the flag should be treated. It should be treated like a living thing, according to the flag code. And it's not just a metaphor to say that, that men have died for that flag. You look at the Civil War, and there were color sergeants who went into battle unarmed, just carrying uh, the flag <clears throat> as a symbol, as a rallying point uh, for their comrades, as a way to organize uh, troops in the heat of battle when smoke has created uh, all sorts of uh, confusion. Right around the spot where Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address, seven uh, soldiers, Union soldiers, were killed defending the flag. Story about the Battle of Gret Get, um, Fredericksburg. There was a color sergeant wounded, hands the flag over to another col color sergeant wounded, hands it over to another col color sergeant who runs to a mortally wounded officer so he can be wrapped in the flag and breathe his last breaths in the flag. First African American uh, to win a Medal of Honor um, <clears throat> was a, a Civil War soldier who uh, exhibited incredible bravery, preserving and lifting uh, the flag. So to me, this means that protest movements should always wrap themselves in the flag uh, rather than let themselves get defined in any way in opposition to the flag, and that political movements should uh, wrap themselves in the flag. I covered Barack Obama's acceptance speech to the Democratic nomination uh, in Denver <clears throat> in 2008. And uh, at the end of this speech, I was, I was sort of, I was on the field level, but back towards the, the stands, and I was crouching down to file something quickly on, on my Blackberry. This was a long time ago, so I had a Blackberry. And this thing was like whipping my head. It's like, why, what is this? And then I look up, and <clears throat> there's this um, African-American family in the first row that had like a huge honking flag, like a car dealership dealership flag, and they're just waving this thing and waving this thing, and it was wonderful uh, to see, and any movement or candidate who doesn't take advantage of that uh, is, is really uh, missing out. And then final point <clears throat> is that we need to teach our history, and it needs to be a truthful history. It needs to be truthful about our myriad national sins, from chattel slavery to Jim Crow, treatment of the Indians, but can't and shouldn't just be a tale of unrelieved oppression and woe. It should be the, the glorious story of this people making their way in a promised land. And we can argue about various issues uh, in American history, about how much emphasis to give this or that, but the fact is <clears throat> this history very often is not being taught at all. You know, only one-fifth of colleges and universities have any requirement that American history or uh, government classes be uh, taken by their students. Even history majors at most colleges and universities aren't required to take American history. So this is why you get these incredible surveys with, you know, 75% of students can't associate James Madison with the father of the Constitution, who had no idea uh, what the Gettysburg uh, Address was. And, and this is a really dangerous thing, because if you don't know your own story, you don't know who you are, and you lose, ultimately, the basis for any coherent action. The great historian William McNeil uh, wrote about this and wrote about how in World War II, uh, one factor that fortified uh, the British in the fight against the Nazis was the story they'd, they'd constantly to been told about their own history, that they oftentimes lost initial battles with continental powers, but then went on, ultimately, uh, to win, win the war. So let me just conclude um, with, with a statement that gets more eloquently than, than I ever could at, at what I'm trying to express about the importance of, of place and of attachment to this country and attachment to one another. It was a speech given by a scholar named John Thornton Kirkland in 1798. He would go on to be the, the president of Harvard University. And he said this, we have learned to love our country because it is our country, because we are near it and in it and have an opportunity of being useful to it, because we breathe its air and share its bounties, because the sweat of our father's brow has subdued its soil, their blood watered its fields, and their revered dust sleeps in its bosom, 
because it embraces our fathers and mothers, our wives and children, our brothers and sisters. Because here are our altars and here are our firesides. Because patriotism is the combined energy of the social affections. And he who can tear it from his heart commits sacrilege upon his nature. Thank you very much. My name is Sabrina Garland. I'm a student here at ASU. I had a question to ask if you could elaborate on the the cultural cohesion or the identity of you know being an American or nationalism for those who, uh, for example, my mother. She's from Germany. Uh, she came here 30 years ago. So for someone that's just coming to this country that has no previous ties with the country, but feels as though they want to become a part of it, what then do you say to them if they? don't share the historical culture or personality as to what would make them an American? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, this is a country that, it, compared to most places around the world, is an open society and where it's possible uh, to become an American. Now, that involves embracing our ideals, our institutions, but it also involves adopting the culture, which immigrants all across our history have actually uh, done. Um, you know, I have a, a friend who is married to a, um, a woman from South Korea, and uh, she came here in, in her teens, and when she goes back to, uh, she's like 35 now or so, and when she goes back to South Korea, even if she's speaking Korean, you know, isn't doing anything very American, they can just sense other Koreans, she's American, there, there's something, she's absorbed uh, the culture uh, of this this country. So it starts with learning the language, which immigrants across, across our, our history uh, have have done, and ad adopting our mores and feeling um, uh, a, 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 that uh, an attachment to America is your principal national loyalty. And I don't think that's too much to ask. Uh, again, I think it's something we've asked throughout our history, and it's actually uh, happened. Uh, throughout our history. What I worry about now is, is this kind of culture of assimilation and machi machinery of assimilation is breaking down somewhat. That's, uh, um, that's, that's worrisome. Um, but people come here and they become and they feel um, Americans. And did, did you say your mother was from? from I'm, that's probably true of her, right? Um, it's certainly, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't look at you and say, you're German. You're not. You're fully um, American. And, and that's been um, that, that's been a wondrous process that's played out through our history. Thank you for your question. I, I have a question in, in, rega in regards to uh, uh, when, when drawing these kind of notions of nation and nationalism, when do cultural differences become too great to maintain a nation, and when does a nation enter into the state of being no longer a nation state but an empire? You know, in the context of this, you mentioned cases like Spain, you know, and Catalonia, and even then, there's increasing concerns over the Basque, the Galicians, and even the Andalusians. You know, they have a coming apart almost of their culture. And similarly, there's concerns here in America, naturally. You know, a West Coast ever greater from the East and then the interior that hates them both. How, when when does, do these lines cross that a nation is no longer a nation but an empire? And then what, wh what happens then? And how can we tell if we're heading in that direction or if we can reverse that trend? Yeah, it's an it's a excellent question. Uh, question and uh, w one that's very, um, should be very much on our minds at this time. First of all, I, I would say, uh, you, when do you become an, an empire? And, and I, I know you're kind of, you get at this from the other end, but um, you know, nationalism can become aggressive and it can uh, justify uh, going and trying to govern other people. Uh, but once you're actually doing that, it's imperialism. It's, it's something um, different. Now, what defines a nation, it's, it's, it's sort of arbitrary. It's when a people feel themselves to be a nation, are recognized by others as a nation, and can vindicate uh, their national uh, prerogatives and to defend uh, their borders. But, th but this is, there's going to be disagreement over this. There's been disagreement uh, over this throughout all of uh, world history and continues to be uh, to this day. In terms of, of the United States, I just think our, our national unity is absolutely um, essential. And e even at this time of incredible 
uh, dissension and poisonous partisanship. One, it's not as bad as it was in very recent memory, like within my lifetime. In the, the, um, the 70s, there were domestic bombings, uh, there were riots and cities being uh, nearly burned uh, to the ground. Uh, we have nothing on, on par with that uh, now. But, you know, if California were ever to attempt to go its way, or um, uh, we, we'd have another, other attempts at secession, it would, it would uh, um, you know, our institutions wouldn't survive that, um, and, and, and our power uh, would be much diminished. So I think that's something to be, um, uh, to be avoided at all costs, and I think uh, th this sense of, of uh, kind of a lowest common denom uh, denominator nationalism that I've been trying to express and defend is part of the solution to that. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Firstly, thank you for coming out. Secondly, uh, it seems to me, at least nowadays, patriotism is generally defined in the way that you define nationalism, and nationalism is defined as the abuse of said patriotism. What, what's really the danger of redefining these terms if they're consistent? <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And, um, you know, at a certain level, if you, want, you just want to call everything that I think is nationalism patriotism, but adopt it substantively, okay, you know, I can probably live with that. But I just think the, um, the term, you know, I think nationalism involves a, uh, a defense of, of borders, a um, paying attention to your, your immigration uh, policy, and would you really define that as a patriotic agenda? So, so if, 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 I, if I support that and I call it patriotic and you have a different view, are you unpatriotic? So I think that's, that's a problem, I think, with uh, defining this, this patriotism, defining this nationalism as patriotism. Or if we take the Hamiltonian tradition, if we call that patriotic, uh, you know, uh, the patriotic tradition, does that mean Thomas Jefferson was unpatriotic? Um, so I, I think that's, that, that's a problem with, with uh, uh, not using the, the terms precisely, but I, I know what you're getting at, okay, and it's reasonable. Oh, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> hi, I'd like to follow up on that uh, last question uh, a little bit, uh, impress on that a little more. I, I am very much persuaded by or sympathetic to the, uh, to the substance and ideas that you've, that you've laid out, but uh, I am concerned about extolling this as a vision of nationalism, and I think you can embrace the notion of the nation and all that that entails without embracing nationalism. When Muslims embrace the concept of Islam, many are skepti skeptical of Islamicism. We're, we all embrace the notion of America, but we don't offer arguments for Americanism, per se. And so um, you made that distinction at the beginning between patriotism and nationalism. One of the th vital distinctions, it seems to me, is patriotism is offering an account of, of love for one's country. And I think what you were trying to do is articulate what are the reasons for that? Why should we have it? Nationalism seems to me much more of an ideology. Right? It's an ideo and, it's, and it's an ideology in, same, in many ways it's very uh, incompatible with the American approach. So nationalism assumes that pursuing one's own interests over and above other people's interests. I don't think that's necessarily entirely compatible with the notion of the city on the hill and the exceptionalist model where we're, we're trying to make the world a better place as well, uh, our defense of democracy around the world. Uh, I don't think the idea that, um, uh, that we have no other reference point around the, beyond the nation, which is common of nationalism, is, is central to America. You note the references to Amos and to, to to notions of God's judgment upon the United States. And finally, I don't think that the notion of the unity being vested in something, some vestige of, of history, of language, of um, peoplehood, ethnicity, race, race, all of that is very sort of backwards looking. And American nationalism is supposed to be forward looking. And that's actually why people love this country, even if they don't really know it, because they are looking at opportunities and looking towards the future. So I think in all of those ways, patriotism seems very, very different from this kind of vision of nationalism. And so. Yeah, so th there's, a, there's a lot there. I, I would say, you know, the, the, um, uh, the um, big nations, um, important nations, their nationalism is always suffused with ideals. So there's not an opposition between those two. And uh, the great nationalisms also kind of fuse the particular with the universal. Um, this goes back to ancient Israel, which is going to be a light unto all nations. Uh, England has, has this idea very early on that it's, that it's, it's a leader 
uh, and liberty. And then, um, you know, for better or worse, uh, very often worse, has this idea of, of a civilizing mission that it's going to have. The French, you know, it begins with the, the idea, you know, time of Joan, that they had the most Christian uh, king. Um, so it's this Christian light to the world. And then after the revolution, it becomes they're going to they're going to hold up these secular ideals and crusade uh, for them. And in the United States, um, obviously, it's it's the idea um, that uh, uh, even if we're just tending our garden here at home, that we're an example uh, for everyone around the world. So there's not an opposition between nationalism and ideals. And it, you just you you um, everything that that you um, admire about America, and I'm sure we, we uh, agree on almost all of them, none of them would really exist without uh, this kind of nationalism I'm describing. If we didn't have national power, uh, if we weren't a continental uh, nation, um, we wouldn't have been able to vindicate you know, uh, uh, these ideals in World War I, World War II, and sort of creating the, the post-war uh, order afterwards. If we just you know, clung to the, the eastern seaboard, We'd have ideals the way the Swiss have ideals, but who cares, right? The, um, so the, the, the power is caught up with the, uh, well, the Swiss do, but who else does? Um, I'm not anti-Swiss. I hope I haven't offended any Swiss people in the, in the audience. But the, um, the ideals depended on our unity and our power and on our coherence. And again, you know, I discussed the Constitution briefly. Um, you know, a very real concern of um, the Federalists at, at that time was if you didn't have a, a national government, that the whole project would collapse in dissension and the ideals would be uh, discredited. So I think the, these things are related and dependent on one another. I know I haven't answered all your points, but that would be my, my brief take. Can we just, we, we can get through everybody in the line, brief questions and maybe br briefer answers and we'll adjust the oh. time. Oh yeah, it's gonna five throw five me five under five the five bus, Paul. It's five my five fault, five my five long five answer. Questions. <laughs> five questions. Hello, my name is Jacek Spendel. I am from Poland, and I uh, <clears throat> want to tell you at the beginning, very shortly, uh, that in Polish constitution there is a definition of nation with capital N, and it means all the citizens of Poland who subscribe to Polish law, Polish constitution, but this is the only place where a uh, nation is understood that way. All the people in po most of the people in Poland understand it as ethnicity, and uh, here's the problem. The people who describe themselves as nationalists in my country, they, they understand it very ethnically based. So uh, they, the question, okay, in America is very different. This is great. Uh, however, if we look on the right wing of the political arena here, uh, of course, the nationalist ingredient was alway, always part of conservatism. To some degree, it was part of the progressive movement. However, I do see some change. Uh, recently, I watched a uh, debate between uh, George uh, Bush uh, and Ronald Reagan from 1980, primaries, and they talk about immigration, and they talk very, very differently about this aspect that people do talk in Republican Party about immigration right now. So they, they were positive uh, about this concept. Uh, so we, we have a rever uh, revival of nationalism in, within the conservative camp. Uh, don't you think it has to do with more like um, negative aspect of nationalism? Yeah. So um, one, I, I would say American nationalism is different than the nationalism you have in, in Central uh, and Eastern Europe. I would say Poland, though, you, you have you know more about the history and culture of Poland uh, than I do, but I think the best speech that Trump's given uh, during his presidency was his speech in, in Warsaw about how the Polish na nation endured um, because of the, the things that set it apart and make Polish people Poles. And this is the, the one time I think that Trump's ever said anything uh, that, uh, in common with Rousseau, who made this point as well, who you know to told the Poles, you know, whoever's trying to tear you apart, whoever's occupying in any given time, if you stay true to your culture and what makes you distinctive, they'll never be able to wipe you out, and that's been true. On immigration, uh, I just think the, the open-handed uh, policy of, of Ronald Reagan uh, was wrong. Uh, we are in some sense a nation of immigrants, but that doesn't mean that we should thought, thoughtlessly adopt a, uh, a high level of immigration uh, always and forever without regard uh, to how it affects our national 
uh, interest. And uh, I, I would change our immigration policy, reduce numbers somewhat, uh, but certainly reduce, uh, to change the, the mix of the kind of immigrants we're ex uh, accepting, to put more of an emphasis on skills and that people who can thrive in a 21st century economy as soon as they uh, get here, the way uh, places like Canada and Australia do. And I, I don't think that is a, uh, um, a, a hateful or negative thing. Thank you. Hi, I just wanted to ask, um, since you uh, mentioned that uh, nationalism is obviously a contentious issue at the moment, and obviously you're part of that debate, uh, and as you noted, the left is kind of abandoning it, I'm just wondering uh, if you could briefly expand on what do you think the future is for nationalism in America? Well, it, um, on the right, it, it depends a little bit on how the Trump phenomenon um, turns out. You know, if you were to lose, say, in November to uh, Bernie Sanders, um, he, he would be, the, the project, the, the whole Trumpian project would uh, risk being discredited, even for conservatives, and I think there'd be a reflex among some Republicans to want to uh, return uh, to the, the party status quo circa 2004 or something. I think that would be a mistake, uh, and I, I think uh, Republicans need to, to um, consider how to thoughtfully integrate um, a populism and a nationalism in their program. Um, in terms of, of Democratic Party, I, d I don't see them um, uh, reconnecting with, with nationalism anytime soon. So despite my hope that it would be a unifying um, uh, factor, it, it probably won't be uh, in the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the fascinating uh, presentation. I think I heard you use the term color in reference to uh, some Civil War soldiers. Just a piece of advice, stop using the word, the term color. Uh, I, no, excuse me, sorry, sorry, I, I didn't. Co color sergeant. Okay. Co the colors, okay, the right, colors okay, of the okay, flag. Gotcha, gotcha. Yep. But the, the question is, why can't America be both an idea and a place? Mm -hmm. I and mean, it's a good question, and, and it is. Um, I, again, and I, saying it's just an idea is uh, an unsupportable overstatement, but the, um, that we have ideals and have had since the beginning um, that define our national project is absolutely true. So I don't, I don't want to, um, anyone to come away with that, just think we're uh, a place. Um, we've had, had these, these ideals um, that existed actually prior to our founding documents then are em embodied uh, in, in our founding uh, documents and are a key part of who, who we are. Thank you very much. Thank you.